The Ideals of an Archon is a very curious narrative tool that Genshin Impact uses to characterize the gods. But what we need to understand is if the Archons embody those ideas in the right way. Because the more we go through Genshin's story, we suddenly see not only the contradictions, but also the dangers of blindly following one's ideals without remorse. So, welcome to the relationships of the Archons and their ideals, where today, I will be analyzing and dissecting how Genshin Impact's narrative uses the Archon's ideals to shape the story of the game and the story of the character. And I'll also be analyzing how each of the Archons embody that ideal and the price they pay for those ideals. But before we begin, thank you to Opera GX for sponsoring this video. Opera GX is a browser built specifically for gamers. Or if you're like me that use it for school. <laughs> Anyway, I'm here to show you a new feature that has saved me from accidentally doxing myself on stream. Opera GX has a new feature called GX Profiles, where you can make a profile for any online activity. You want the stream? They've got you covered with the streaming configuration to make sure you don't do anything stupid. Or if your PC isn't running like it used to, you can run Potato so that your browsing profile is on its most basic form. Or if you're like me who want to wipe their browser history data upon closing, you can go rogue! But why would you ever want to do that, right? <laughs> so for my personal favorite features, force dark mode makes sure you don't go blind reading clearly legal things online. Customizable themes and animated wallpapers if you're like me that enjoys the aesthetics of browsing. A quick import tool that lets you grab stuff like the browsing history, bookmarks, and cookies from your previous browser. You know, assuming you have a browser history. But with an absolutely banger of a feature, workspaces that let you switch between sets of tabs from the sidebar. God bless, you have no idea how much my research heart is like pounding for this feature. Look at my tabs, if I accidentally delete one of them, I'm gone. <clears throat> anyway, download Opera GX with the link down below and tell me what your favorite part of the browser is. Oh, and Opera GX is now available on mobile, so I can finally read my fanfictions in dark mode. When you mention the ideals, these are the ideals of each of the Archons. Freedom, contracts, eternity, wisdom, justice, war, and love. The impact of the ideals in the game is almost everywhere in the Archon quests and their characterization. When you look at it, the conflict brought from these ideals are horrifying. In Mondstadt's Archon quest, the word freedom was almost synonymous to absence, given that Venti's alleged freedom came at the cost of Devalin's well-being because Venti was absent for several years or centuries. In Liyue, the contract between the Saritsa and Zhongli sent Liyue into chaos. While people argue that Liyue wasn't in any real danger, the distress and the panic people felt as Osail was resurrected, as they saw their own god die in front of them, or as they saw the Fatui invade their homeland is very much real. All because of the unknown contract between the Saritsa and Zhongli. In Inazuma, the Vision Hunt decree began because of Ace's pursuit for eternity. She was so caught up with the idea that change and ambition can only bring pain and suffering, which is why she didn't want humanity to suffer the same loss she had. But she expressed that in the most unhealthy way possible by demanding Inazuma undergo a stasis. The ideals of the gods are constantly the source of conflict for the story, and even more so for the characterization of the gods. Let's analyze deeper. Freedom is Venti's ideal, but Venti embodies his ideal through contradiction. The perfect form of freedom is autonomy. It's not anarchy or the lack of rules and laws, but instead the capacity of choice and expression. Freedom is the wind, free to go wherever it pleases. This is what Venti envisions for Mondstadt, but the way that Venti embodies his ideal is horribly imperfect. The ideal of freedom in Venti's characterization is a split between the extreme consequences of it and how it might just be a facade. Venti's freedom, besides his carefree personality, is still very much hollow and problematic. Freedom on paper is a great ideal, but if you dive deeper into Venti's characterization, you'll start seeing cracks. Venti's role as an absent archon represents the extreme side of freedom. Absence, disconnection, lack of agency, and authority. While Venti wants Mondstadt to be free, it's still clear that Venti's role as an Archon to the city is intermittent. We do see that while out of the three Archons, Venti is free to relax and rest, there are consequences to his absence. The price for his freedom for Mondstadt's responsibilities is most evident in his confusion about times, his disconnection with what's really going on with Mondstadt. We see this in the manga where he wasn't aware that the aristocracy has completely shifted how Mondstadt is run. He even has to ask about the Ludihar past them and why it was being played that way. According to the breeze amidst the forest, 
Venti only wakes up after the prayers of the people reach him, which means that he was in a slumber for a long time prior, and that most likely means he doesn't have a true understanding of the situation until it was already time for the cataclysm proper. And we even see this in the Archon quest of Mondstadt. Venti was confused when the Traveler called the Valen Storm Terror, and he tells Storm Terror that he's back and that he was sorry for leaving him. Of course it's about Storm Terror! Storm? Cut it with the amnesia act! Venti's hello voice line is even him saying he had a refreshing sleep. Venti's freedom comes at the cost of consistent support, knowledge, and protection. Yes, he's there when he needs to be, but that inconsistency is dangerous. From what we currently know now in the lore, Venti is only awake when something big happens in Mondstadt, which means that Venti might be free from ruling Mondstadt and its authorities, but that means most of his existence has a lot of gaps. But what I want to clarify is that I don't blame Venti. Venti is not disregarding the people of Mondstadt or actually willingly abandoning them, because I believe that Venti himself isn't as free as a lot of people like to believe. Firstly, Venti, despite his lackadaisical nature, is still bound to responsibility to Mondstadt. He is there when he needs to be. He has been through major events in Mondstadt's history and was awake to instigate change. He was there when Vanessa rose against the aristocracy and when the Knights of Avonius was still being created. He was there for the Cataclysm and for Storm Terror. Which leads me to theorize something crucial about Venti's fate. Venti's waking and sleeping moments are not dictated by himself. Or at least, most certainly not his waking time. If you remember the start of the manga, Venti himself asks how long he's been asleep, as though he can't control when he wakes up. Not to mention, if he had known that the Valen was attacking Mondstadt, don't you think he'd have woken himself up to stop him earlier? It's possible that Venti's constant repetition of sleeping for centuries and waking up to help Mondstadt are tied into another being of Mondstadt's divinity, the God of Time. According to the sacrificial series in the Thousand Winds Temple, the God of Time, or Istaroth, is the entity that ruled alongside Barbados before disappearing without a trace. But what's important is how she regards the cultivation of seeds and their growth in the time most opportune. This continuous cycle of Venti waking and sleeping might be tied with how Istaroth alludes to seeds and stories brought by the wind but cultivated through time. Going back on Venti's line from the Archon quest, if Venti's fate was being dictated by another entity entirely, or his fate is sealed in a perpetual state that even he can control, then how free really is he? Thirdly though, Venti's manner of talking is very suspicious if you analyze it. Yes, Venti is able to tell us more about Celestia and the other gods, or more necessarily that Venti is more open about sharing information. That is most apparent with the Allegenes. I think that's because his ideal is freedom and that he has no real true responsibility to uphold any secrets. But observe how he always skirts around information. When asked about Celestia, he deflects and begins insulting it, along with the Pyro Archon and Zhang Li. When asked about being a god in the manga, Venti doesn't give a straight answer and instead talks in a song. And when asked about Celestia in the manga directly, Venti is hesitant to share any information in the first place and shifts to the next topic. Venti's freedom to talk about divinity, gods, and Celestia isn't as permissible as we like to believe. I would argue that he has much freedom to speak about the gods as A and Zhang Li. Maybe the reason he speaks so vaguely is because it bends the rules. He is vague because he has to be. He says things but refuses to elaborate. Why though? We don't know either. Venti is there when he has to be. And that he is destined to return to stasis when he wants to rest. But if what I said about Venti being only awake when something big happens is true, now the question becomes, what's about to happen to Mondstadt? Contracts is John Lee's ideal. John Lee embodies his ideal through resigned obedience. Contracts in its base form is commitment, agreement, and consent. That is the most important part of John Lee's ideal that he personally holds to the highest regard. The reason you have a contract in the first place was because both parties agreed and that it's a form of honor for you to uphold. Remove those ideals from our world and all you have is empty promises. But too much of it means unrelenting obedience with no room for renegotiation. Zhang Li's adherence to his ideal is almost to the same level as A before the Traveler intervened. 
And to this day, Zhang Li's attitude towards contracts remains resilient. When Venti called him a blockhead, we can definitely see that with how he upholds the ideals of contracts. Zhang Li does not give room for change of terms. In the story quest, we see how seriously he takes the contracts even when the Fatui agent already disrespected it. He still retains its integrity even though the woman is the only one still actively participating in the contract. Even when the contract already feels terminated, or that an occurrence that could have compromised the terms occurred, Zhang Li still holds his ideals firm. When there's a contract, nothing can be allowed to slide. If the contract is not followed, then it is broken. It is a punishment after all. I did not want to tell her such cruel facts, but the contract was broken. The important thing to consider about contracts is that it's neutral. It's meant to be a consented agreement, and the terms were placed down for both parties. Zhang Li is neither evil nor good. I also do want to point out that breaking a contract is not the same as ending a contract. Ending a contract implies consent, or that the initial purpose of it was fulfilled. It's not that Zhang Li is angered by change, but rather the disregard of a promise. However, it's not like Zhang Li is unfeeling when he knows a contract is not advisable to be followed. He knows when a contract isn't fair for another party involved. But he can't really do anything about it. When Paimon relents about his inability to share about Conria, Zhang Li apologizes and says that this was his contract to secrecy. Same as well with the Saritza. Zhang Li knows that the contract might potentially inconvenience or even harm other people. And I think that's pretty sad. When you see how Zhang Li acts, it's almost as though he's already resigned himself to this responsibility. He's already accepted that in life, you can't just have everything. He's the Archon who talks about erosion the most and even simply accepts that it's bound to happen. I think this line of dialogue from him sums up his attitude towards contracts and, by extension, responsibility very well. People abandon and surrender the things they love to pursue the right path. Perhaps this is the erosion imposed on me by the heavenly principles. You two are friends to me. I can assure it brings me no pleasure to disappoint you. But as the god of contracts, I cannot go back on my word. We see how an Archon's ideals shape both the reason for not only their actions, but also their personality. Zhang Li holds his ideals firmly like a rock, but understands that there are times he must be stone cold. And thus, he resigned himself to that fate, whether he likes it or not. Eternity is A's ideal. A embodied her ideal through delusion. The concept of eternity in and of itself is impossible to grasp for you mortals. But in its most optimal form, it means consistency. The continuation of a system, of traditions, and of history. But eternity, when you look at it from A's perspective during the Archon Quest, was stasis. Eternity involves isolation to change because you don't want external forces that can mess up your system. Things and people that are considered exceptional are removed from the system. That's why divisions were taken. Visions embodied something so inherent in humanity that was antithetical to eternity. Ambition. And when there's ambition, there is a want to change, to grow, and to adapt. A, on the other hand, feared change because of loss. She feared for Inazuma to change because to her, eternity was the only way to stop grief. Humans live such short lives that she doesn't want them to undergo the pain of change. The plane of Euthymia is a great example of this. Her consciousness permanently suspended as she meditates, free from any external factors that could wither her concept of perfect eternity. Now, unlike Venti's facade of freedom or Zhang Li's absolute adherence to contracts because of obligation, A's reason for upholding her ideal through her vision hunt decree centered around emotion. She feared loss so she blamed change. Eternity became this goal, this horrible delusion because she didn't want Inazuma to go through what she went through. Eternity was a coping mechanism. Honestly, it makes perfect sense. If you think about it, the other ideals like freedom, justice, war are attainable in some way, while the word eternity just seems so out of the grasp. You cannot stop progress no matter how hard you try. 
and nothing in this world is eternal except change. Which is why as A underwent her story quests and her character development, it was crucial for her to understand that eternity was not the same as perfect stasis. It was crucial for her to understand why Makoto believed in transience. It was crucial for her to understand that change and progress are important for Inazuma, and that eternity can be expressed through different ways, through culture, history, tradition, or just simply human life. Just the preservation of Inazuma's identity would keep it eternal. Ei's final battle with the Raiden Shogun puppet was crucial to her character development because it was the perfect embodiment of her fighting against her old ideals. My form is a symbol of supreme majesty in which has been vested power over all the realm. It is the cohesive embodiment of all that constitutes the Raiden Shogun. It inherits Ei's pain. The pain of inevitable loss that comes as she moves forward. So too does it inherit her determination to reach eternity. Every action undertaken is for the sake of resisting erosion, determination, courage, love, hatred. All of these will be degraded and distorted by the incessant flow of time. Only rules shall remain constant for eternity. Those were my thoughts when I created you. Now, they are towering obstacles that I have no choice but to overcome. A's story is fascinating because we see what happens when an Archon changes their mind about their ideals. It gives us a fresh narrative that shows us that the ideals and the definition of those ideals are not set in stone. I just wonder though, what happens with other Archons? Wisdom is Kusanali's ideal. Kusanali embodies her ideal through false correlation. Now, unlike the other ideals I've covered, this one tackles its idea in a different light. Venti's was contradiction, Zhongli's was obedience, A's was delusion and change, and now Kusanali's is misinterpretation. Wisdom is a really vague word to define, but it's mostly defined as the understanding of what to do and where and when to do it. But when you talk about Sumeru, one thing always stands out. Knowledge. Sumeru is the land of the god of wisdom, where the quest for wisdom and knowledge is never-ending. But their obsession gives rise to some truly inexplicable things. For example, in Sumeru, knowledge is holistically managed as a resource. Knowledge is a resource? Yes. I don't know whether it was the sages or lesser lord Kusanali who came up with the idea. Here we see what happens when an ideal is commodified. A holds onto hers with an iron grip, but in a way, she did understand the fundamentals of eternity. The problem was with the ideal itself. But here, we see that the ideal of Sumeru is misinterpreted, or even worse, bastardized by its citizens. Because wisdom is not the same as knowledge. When you hear about the Sumeru Academia, it's that constant need for knowledge that's repeated. The constant maddening cries of the erudites, the sacrifice of one's well-being for academics and scholarly pursuits, the simple overworking of students just for results. Knowledge is the name of the game for Sumeru. We hear this dialogue from Dainsleaf. The god of wisdom's enemy is wisdom itself. And the oasis of knowledge is a mirage in the desert of ignorance. In the city of scholars, there is a push for folly. Yet the god of wisdom makes no argument against it. We also have a dialogue from a book from Liyue that says, Under the ages of the god of wisdom, the sages of Sumeru drive themselves into hysterics and abandon all that is worldly in their pursuit of esoteric wisdom. It's almost hilarious. Your ideal is wisdom, but you are doing everything that one considers unwise. It's almost as though she's completely neglecting her intended ideal, and instead of forging it to fit her own personal needs. This is the first time we've seen something like this from the Archons, where an Archon's own enemy is its own ideal. A's eternity was something she advocated for, unlike what's happening with Kusanali, where you need wisdom to rid Sumeru of this massive gluttony for knowledge and power. I have a feeling that when we get to Sumeru, it'll be addressing this massive difference. Justice is the ideal of the Hydro Archon. She embodies her ideal through self-imposition. Justice as an ideal is very altruistic, but it's also very arrogant. The most optimal form of justice is supervision and scrutiny. 
You want a group of people to uphold a law of morals and legality, but also act upon those rules with urgency. There is no point to laws if no one follows the legal system, but too much of it can create an ultimatum, where justice and the legal code are seen as the only true way to rightship. If you dictate yourself to be the ultimate law or the ultimate good, then how long before you're blinded by your own ideal? This is why we have characters like Light Yagami or Goro Akechi who teether on that perversion of self-proclaimed justice. To call yourself the god of justice means that you uphold the law to the highest degree. And with the way Fontaine has its own court, I don't doubt that Fontaine's legal system is given the most emphasis in the country. Yanfei herself laments over Fontaine's legal system. But the thing is, the idea of judging others involves a rightful question. Who gave you the authority? This brings us to the old Hydro Archon. The interaction with the Lock Folk suggests that the current Hydro Archon misused the initial purpose of the Lock Folk. The Lock Folk used to be spread by the old Hydro Archon across the Vat as spies, not because of any malicious intent, but rather to connect to everyone. However, the Lock Folk didn't see the God of Justice as their God, much like the Ocean End in Liyue. It's possible that the God of Justice began making changes to the purpose of the Lock Folk, which made them rebel. Maybe she began using them for surveillance instead of their intended altruistic purpose. Maybe she wanted the lock folk to be her eyes and ears across Tevat. The god of justice lives for the spectacle of the courtroom, seeking to judge all other gods. But even she knows not to make an enemy of the divine. Those are the words of the Hydro Archon quest. Does that mean she declared herself such a god, since she's worried that she'll step on the toes of Celestia if she goes out of line? Even the way she talks about her law and her justice is borderline condescending. My ideals have no stains. I must correct you. People here bear no sins in the eyes of the gods. Only laws in the tribunal can judge someone. They can judge even me. So praise my magnificence and purity. What a joke. The final two ideals won't be covered today. For the sole reason that we have nothing to go off on. The aspect of war is too vague and disconnected from the current information we have with the Pyro Archon, so we need more context. And the current Cryo Archon's ideals is canonically unknown to us, so I'll leave that with you guys. How do you think Genshin's story expresses the relationship of the Cryo and Pyro Archon and their ideals? But nevertheless, my name is Aster and thank you for chilling with me. Also, thank you to Opera Jax for sponsoring this video.